when the temple was built by Solomon, God had to show the people that he approved of the temple. Because if you remember, God had told them to build a tabernacle, right? It was a tent structure where they kept the, uh, the ark of God and they kept, and, and that, that represents the presence of God. And, and David wanted to build a house for God, but God did not allow David to do it. God had Solomon do it. When Solomon built the temple, God had to show them that he approved of this, that his presence would now go from the tabernacle to the temple. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, because Solomon prays, remember, if you read the chapter before, he raised, the few chapters before, he raises up his hands to heaven and he prays for God to basically protect this temple, accept this temple. It says, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven because they had set up a thousand burnt offerings. If you remember from Leviticus chapter 1 when we studied that out. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, notice this, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Look at verse 3. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and how the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. And look, from the beginning, even when they came out of Egypt, remember, they were led in the wilderness by what? A cloud. And that represented the presence of God in their lives. And at night, when they couldn't see the cloud, they saw a pillar of fire. And then we see here, how does God show them that His presence is with them? He brings fire down, and He fills the temple with a cloud, which is the glory of God. So I want you to understand this. When the temple was built, God filled the temple with His glory to show them that His presence was there, that He accepted them, that He was with them. In Ezekiel chapter number 10, go back to it. Ezekiel spends the entire, the entire book of Ezekiel is a prophecy about how Jerusalem and the temple is going to be destroyed. Remember that the Babylonian captivity happened in three phases. Ezekiel came on the second phase. And the third phase will be the final phase where the city is destroyed and the temple is destroyed. That's why Nehemiah and Esther, Nehemiah and Esther, good night, Nehemiah and Ezra have to come back after the captivity. I, I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but after the 70 ca years of captivity, they have to come back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls, right? Because, because Babylon, because Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the city, destroyed the walls, and he destroyed the temple. Here's what the Bible is teaching us. God is about getting ready to destroy the temple. But remember, when they built the temple... His glory came into the temple to show that His presence was there, that His power was there, that His honor was there, that His favor was there, that He was with these people. And now, before the temple gets destroyed, in Ezekiel chapter 10, we have God coming down from heaven to remove His glory from the temple. That's what's happening. Look at verse 3. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court, and the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold. So it's like the glory of the Lord is like standing, you know, at the door of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Look down at verse 18. And the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. They basically just all go back to heaven. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them and everyone that stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. So basically God comes down with his cherubims to grab his glory from the house and go back up to heaven as a sign that he no longer honors or favors or acknowledges this temple. And what happens before the book of Ezekiel ends? The temple is destroyed. Now go to Revelation chapter 1, and let me just give you an application. See, the, the Israelite nation of the Old Testament, they made a few assumptions when God's glory came into the temple. And their assumption was that God's glory would never leave the temple. 
and that no matter what they did, God would always be with them, God would always honor them, God would always favor them. But that's where they messed up. That's the mistake they made. Because they made choices and decisions. Things changed from Solomon to the last king of Israel. Things changed to the point where God said, I no longer honor this building. I no longer honor my presence. I'm removing my glory. And, and this building will be destroyed. This city will be destroyed. And you will be scattered. And, and the nation of Israel was basically scattered throughout the world. And here's what we can learn from this. What we can learn from this is that we must be careful not to assume that God's glory and God's blessing and God's honor will always be upon us no matter what because we can make decisions and choices that would allow the blessing of God to leave us. Now, this happens with the temple, but you know it can happen with churches. Let me show it to you. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 20. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 says this, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. According to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, what are the candlesticks? The candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia that the book of Revelation was written to. Notice chapter 2 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Skip down to verse 5 for sake of time. Notice what he says. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. He's talking to the church of Ephesus. He says, you got to repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee and will remove thy candlestick. What's the candlestick? The candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. He said, I'll remove the candlestick out of his place except thou repent. You know that God can remove his candlestick from a church? Where there might still be a building where people meet together and they call it a church and they call it an assembly, but God's presence is no longer there. And we're not talking about losing your salvation. Obviously, God indwells you, the Holy Spirit, you know, indwells bodies of believers. But God, you know, a church can come to a place where God says, you've taken too many decisions. You've done too many things. You need to repent and go back to your first works. Or I might just remove my presence. I might just remove my favor. I might just remove my power from that place. And you know, I'm thankful for the ministry that the Lord has given us here at Verity Baptist Church. And I don't know if you realize that we're not only uh, ministering to you, but you and what you do and how you serve in this church is literally impacting the world. Thousands of people are, 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 are impacted by the things that are done by this church. And we get emails and we get messages all the time from people all over the country and all over the world saying, your ministry has been a blessing to me. Your ministry has helped me. This sermon has been great or this series has been great or these documentaries have been great. But listen to me. We need to make sure that we don't take it for granted that God's blessing and favor will always be upon our church. Because we can begin to make decisions and choices and begin to stop doing things and start doing things that might bring us to the place like the temple where the glory of the Lord was removed. It can happen to the temple. It can happen to churches. But let me just say this, and, and, and we'll finish up, and I went more than five minutes, and I apologize, but let me, let me just say this. I need, you to, I need you to get this. Go to Judges 16. Judges 16. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Let me, while you turn there, let me read for you. It can happen to nations. 1 Samuel 4.21, don't turn there. You go to Judges 16. I'll read to you from 1 Samuel 4.21. Remember when the ark was taken? The Bible says, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. So it can happen to nations. It happened to the nation of Israel when the ark was taken, the glory of the Lord was, was taken. It can happen to the temple where the glory of the Lord was taken from the temple. It can happen to churches where God removes the candlestick. But listen to me very carefully. If you've caught nothing this sermon, I need to catch this. It can happen to you. It can happen to Christians, to believers, to individuals. Judges 16, verse 20. That's what the Bible says. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Who is Samson? A great judge of God. Had the power of God upon his life. Had the honor and favor and glory of God. But he took steps 
and he made decisions, and he went places, and he went with people, and he did things that he shouldn't have done, and he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself because every other time he woke up and shook himself and roared a little bit and flexed and it wasn't him, it was the power of God. It was the glory of God. It was the favor of God upon his life. But Samson eventually took it too far where he woke up and he said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. And of course, you will never lose the Holy Spirit as far as your salvation is concerned. But please understand this, that you're sitting in this auditorium on a Wednesday night, and you maybe go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, and you go soul winning, and you read your Bible, and you memorize scripture, and you listen to preaching outside of church, and you've got a really great marriage, and you've got some great children, And don't take it for granted that it'll be just like that a year from now or two years from now or three years from now because there have been people in this church just like you who were three to thrive, who were reading the Bible, who were going soul winning, who were memorizing scripture, who were having great marriages, who were raising great children. But they began to take steps in the wrong directions. They decided, oh, I'm going to go move over here, and that won't affect my church. I'm going to take this job that's going to take me away from church, or I'm going to make this decision. I'm going to join this hobby or this club. And they began to make decisions. And one day they shook themselves, and they never even realized that the glory of God, the power of God, the favor of God. One day they woke up, and they were divorced. One day they woke up, and their kids were not spiritual. One day they woke up and they say they were drinking, they were backslidden, and they said, what happened? What happened was that they took for granted that God's power would always be available. That's what they did with the temple. That's what some churches do, and that's what some Christians do. And I'm just here to tell you that things can change drastically in a year, in two, in three, in five, in ten. Because you can begin to make the wrong decision, the wrong decision, the wrong decision. You say, how do I keep the power of God upon my life? Keep doing what got you the power of God upon your life? Look, if coming to church on Wednesday night got you to be the type of husband or the type of wife or the type of parent you are, you know what you should keep doing? Keep coming to church on Wednesday night. If being a soul winner got you to the place in your life where you are right now, then why don't you just keep on soul winning? Why don't you just keep on reading the Bible? Why don't you just keep on reading? Because here's all I'm telling you. You can begin to make choices and decisions. What did Samson do? He said, I'm going to go hang out with the Philistines. It won't hurt me. I'm going to go hang out with Delilah. It won't hurt me. I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go do that. And every time I wake up, it's fine. But listen to me, Samson. One day you're going to wake up, and you'll wish not that the power of God was departed. So learn from this chapter. Because Ezekiel sees this vision, this spiritual vision, where God spiritually removes his glory. But a few chapters later, the temple is destroyed. And you may begin to make decisions and take steps and go in the wrong direction and never realize that the power of God departed from your life till your life, like the temple, is destroyed. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.